actually a test radiologist, but I'm interested in interventional procedures. And so um, when I came to UCLA, I started doing thoracic procedures and uh, I grew into that practice. So yeah, and since then uh, we've been working, I've been working with Dr. Cameron and uh, mesothelioma is a big part of our program. Um, so I'm going to just briefly talk about um, the, what I do is, is cryoablation, but basically we, uh, we introduce needles or probes inside a lesion and we create an ice ball and uh, use that to destroy cancer cells. You already saw by some of the uh, data Dr. Cameron showed that these mesothelial cells do respond pretty well to ice and sort of a sub-zero temperatures. And uh, even though we were not aware of it right when we started, it really has shown uh, that sort of a response in our clinical practice. Uh, I'm going to talk about the mechanism of this uh, modality and its technique. The data which we got an acceptance yesterday in one of the journals uh, and then the future directions, which is mostly what uh, combining this ablation technique with other modalities. Here, you know, historically, um, this sort of a cryoablation was introduced uh, or in the chest or in the lung back in 2005. Uh, it's not a very old, it's been used very often in many places, you know, use ice to sort of cool places or kill tissue back in maybe five to uh, 600 years back. But in, in the chest, it all started back in 2005. It was a combined combination of an um, American and a Chinese investigator who did 200 cryoablations uh, in the lung. And um, um, it was an impressive results, um, not much complications, but none of the patients had recurrent mesothelioma. It was all mostly done either in lung cancer or uh, metastasis from a uh, solid organ. Um, we got the machine in 2007 um, or introduced it in the lung in 2007. Most centers actually have these uh, machines. Uh, urology uses it for prostate and kidney management and ablation, but we started using it in the lung. Uh, we did our first case in 2008, and you can see um, in the graph here, we had uh, right off the bat, we had a quite a good uh, sort of an increase in number of cases uh, uh, we were doing. We are seeing a little decline in cryo. Um, I think we caught up with a lot of the older cases and. Uh, and um, I guess there's a little bit of uh, less recurrence these days. So how this whole cryoablation came about using it in mesothelioma, I got a very interesting story I just want to share it with you. Um, and that's very important how patients actually reach out to us. We got a phone call uh, in my office um, that a patient is looking to get some treatment done for a mesothelioma. The patient was not in the United States, was outside the United States. So um, I speak to the patient. Patient healthcare system would not do a surgical resection because a part of the tumor, as you can see here, was extending outside uh, the chest wall. And uh, they said they want somebody to do something about it. Uh, I didn't know what to say. I wasn't very familiar with mesothelioma. So I'm thinking about the case, go to the cafeteria, get a coffee, see Dr. Cameron. Um, walk up to him. I say, I'm interested, this is a patient, I got a phone call, I'm gonna refer it to you. He said, uh, why don't you do an ablation? You know, you downstage it and maybe they'll do the surgery. So we reached out to the surgeon, he introduced me a surgeon in, uh, in, in London, I contacted him and he agreed. He said, yes, if you downstage it, then it becomes eligible, then I can do the surgery. And that's what we did. We did the ablation, patient flew here, we did the ablation, and that's the surface uh, of the pleura where the ablation took place. Um, down here, you can see the rest of the mesothelial cells. And then um, the got patient went back and got the fluorectomy done. So that kind of sort of paved the way for us, uh, exploring the fact that we could do this cloud cryoablation for these sort of recurrent mesothelioma patients. Again, not for primary, but for recurrent mesothelioma. Uh, looking at the literature, um, there was not much offered for this recurrent mesothelioma patient. First of all, there's a high recurrence rate. I mean, everyone's talked about it, uh, that these patients have some element of recurrence. If you wait long enough, not all the cancer cells will be removed. Uh, they're all over the, you know, the, some of them are left. And as the patients live longer and longer, this macro, macroscopic residual tissue goes on to develop into macroscopic tissue. And this paper really uh, demonstrates that uh, 
uh, what is to be done for them. You know, uh, radiation is already exhausted because these patients receive radiation. Chemotherapy has some benefits, but it's more systemic. Uh, we uh, second surgery is what it was one of the options and you know that was offered to patients um, but you know not all patients are eligible for surgery they already have undergone surgery uh, once um, this was a study by polity I'm sure you guys know that uh, surgeon more than I do but um, you know the only limited number of patients were eligible for surgery and so um, and not all patients could undergo multiple surgeries. That's another problem. There's not one recurrence. These patients go on to have multiple recurrence. So with that in mind, uh, we kind of started exposing ourselves to more and more of recurrent mesothelioma. Uh, the current cryoablation systems, w um, what they are, is um, there are these probes, which are, um, which are like, like knitting needles, basically, and they're hollow. And we pass argon or uh, gas mostly through these uh, sort of needles. And they're not exposed to the patient. They just run through the probes or through these sort of needles in and out. And uh, they sort of uh, produce an ice wall at the tip of these probes. That's the data from uh, Wang uh, et al., which I told you. And they, they had a very good sort of response, not much complication rate. They showed decrease in size of a tumor in three months. And uh, at six months, uh, up to 86% of their data was smaller. So it was like a very good result to look at. Um, here is uh, the cryo machine. Um, uh, that's a distribution box you see in the corner there. That's a distribution box. Um, these are the tanks with argon and helium. We use helium to heat, heat up the system. You don't want to wait for the ball to melt itself. Uh, the, the tanks are connected to the distribution box. Uh, it's a pretty simple system, um, which has got a freeze cycle, so where you kind of cause a freeze. Uh, then it's a, uh, I can't read it, but uh, there's a thaw cycle, there's a stop, and then you off the machine, you off it. The mo you can connect up to eight probes, and you actually modulate the temperature of how much of gas you're gonna push into the system. These are the probes, they come in different lengths, uh, and they come in different sort of gauges as well. Based on the length and the gauge, you get to make ice balls of different sizes. And these are the ice balls. They don't get created in the air. They have to be in the water or in tissue. They create these sort of ice balls. And they destroy cells pretty well. Uh, there's, a, there's a margin of around three or four millimeters at the edge of the ice ball, which actually the cell death doesn't occur. Cell injury takes place. But everything below, be, I mean, in the, in the interior of the ice ball causes uh, cell death. This is how we place them, and this is one of my colleagues, and we place these through, these, uh, through the skin. It's under CT guidance, where when, when the CT scan is done, um, we mark the area, we place the scope slowly into the lesion, and then we create these ice balls which destroys the cells uh, uh, within the tumor. This is done as a, uh, under local anesthesia. Patients are not under general anesthesia. And patients come in and they go home on the same day. And I'll show you the data on that from our cohort. Uh, these are the, this is a map. Um, we use this to figure out how many probes to put in. Um, usually we put in more than one probe because these tumors, when we get them, is like a little bit larger than one or two centimeters. And you want to definitely get all your margins. So that's the importance of knowing the map to making sure that you have got multiple of these probes in there. The mechanism of cell death is pretty interesting and uh, you know with all the immuno immune response, I think cryo is starting to like sort of find its place not only on direct destruction of cancer cells, but also it's anti-cancer cryoimmunology. So the direct way is um, um, through the ice ball itself, um, these are the these two ways, both direct and indirect, you rapidly kill the cells there and then. Either you create an intracellular ice ball, the cells uh, enlarge and rupture, uh, or uh, as you get to the more periphery, you get an extracellular sort of uh, ice, uh, and that causes dehydration of cell, exactly opposite effect, and that causes cells to get dehydrated, and then the membranes get damaged. And what we do is we do actually two cycles. We do one cycle where we wait, let it thaw, and then we do another cycle. And that, again, pushes some water in and out of these cells and causes them to swell up and rupture on the second cycle. So that's a direct effect. You injure the vessels, small capillaries leading to cells, 
and that causes cell death uh, at some point as well. So these two things occur immediately. But there's another effect, and that's been proven um, in different cell lines, definitely in breast, a lot of study was done in 90s and uh, in renal cell carcinoma, um, where there is an immunological response. What happens with cryo is that you don't, so we have two modalities. We either have heat to kill the cells as interventional radiologists, either have heat or we have cryo. The heat basically causes uh, the denaturation of the protein. So with those patients, we never got this immune response. But with cryo, the proteins don't get denatured and they are released. There's a whole release of these sort of, um, I would say, antigens into the body and the and patients do induce a sort of an immune response or they have uh, immunological markers which gets elevated as a response to increase or this release of antigens. And that's something we hope to take advantage of. Um, and this is some of data uh, from, um, from, the, from the kidney renal cell can cancer model and breast cancer model. And that's the uh, evidence of the immune response and uh, this paper, I mean, I tried to read a lot of them. It's a lot of words I don't understand. But this part I understood. And it, it was simply they took uh, mice model, a breast cancer mice model, and uh, they either did a resection of the uh, cancer or they did cryoablation. And then they rechallenged the, the, the mice with the cancer cells again. And interestingly, the ones which were resected out, they had 86% uh, of them had recurrence, developed tumors were compared to 16% uh, in the cryoablated model. And they went on to conclude that they believe that it's uh, because of the increased, uh, increased immune response to these sort of cancer cells. So uh, as we are working to our, uh, you know, initially we are working towards our development of cryoablation and it's introduced, we realized a few things and um, Literature explains some of it, but a lot of it was through experience. And these ablations are less painful. We were managed to actually do these procedures without general anesthesia as an outpatient local anesthesia procedure. Um, the tumors uh, the, or the ablation preserved the collagen ma matrix, and I'll show you cases why that is important, because the pattern of recurrence of these tumors around the mediastinum, aorta, the crest wall, you know, if you burn that area, you just get a big sort of a like an ulceration or a volcanic area with the crest wall oozing out, but with cryo, we didn't see those. Uh, we could see the ablation mar margin at the edge, which was very important. We knew exactly where we were going, and we could use multiple probes. So the less pain part came right from the beginning. You know, when you look at the data from RFA, they're very painful. RFA is radiofrequency ablation. Same technique, you put a needle, but instead of causing cool, you generate electricity, and that can cause uh, um, burning and cause cell death. But when you look at that, these are very painful. Patients had to undergo general anesthesia to be able to even get these procedures done um, in the periphery of the lung, of course. With cryo, that wasn't the case. Pain wasn't an issue. Of course, bleeding is an issue, and that's something we have to deal with as we're doing the procedure. Um, that's simply because you create an ice ball and uh, as the ice ball melts with all the cancer cells and all the small vessels which were frozen, they kind of start bleeding and we have to deal with the hemorrhage part of it. Um, this, is, this is an example. Here's a tumor you can see in the periphery. It's a common site recurrent tumor um, uh, next to aorta, next to the spine here. We dare not put a like, probe to try to burn this because that collateral injury can cause spinal cord heat up injury uh, pain, the chest wall can burn out. Um, so we place, but with cryo, that wasn't the case. You know, you can really control the amount of ice ball and you know exactly when it gets close to the spinal cord. Uh, we placed uh, three probes, you can see these three probes here. This is an ice ball and the advantage of ice ball again is you can actually see it. You see where the ice ball is going in the tissue. Here's the ice ball kind of going and this is a spinous process. This is back here. You can see some of the ice balls, not here can see developed here. And this is a, this is the same patient uh, six months down the line. You can see how the tumor just sort of the cells uh, rupture and, uh, and, and sort of it melts away. And one of the things you see is not only um, the cells melted away, but the, the cells within the rib also melted away. But the structure of the rib remains as it is because its matrix remains intact. 
So this is the ice ball, as you can see, kind of extending out into the soft tissue. And that's the rest of the cell. Uh, preservation of collagen matrix, I think, I think I think that's a very important part of cryo as well, where you don't actually destroy tissue. You actually keep the scaffolding of cells as they are. It's just the cell or cancer cells we trap. Um, this has been used, uh, again, cryo has been used in the past. Uh, bronchoscopies have used cryo quite often, you know, for endobronchially to either um, destroy cells uh, or, or, or sometimes even take advantage of the cryo sort of becomes adhered to tissue. I'm sure you've seen picture of people sticking their tongue to like a uh, pole and gets attached or something of that sort. It's the same concept, you know, the cryo gets attached to blood clots and desiccated tumor cells and they allow that to be pulled out. So cryo has been used in bronchoscopy for many years and they've shown that the matrix of the bronchus doesn't get that damaged. There was a lot of data uh, uh, on the prostate where they did cryo and they showed that the matrix of prostate didn't change as well. And we used, used that data sort of to replicate into our practice. Here's a case I did, first time I went to OR with Dr. Cameron. Um, in a patient, one of our dear patients, and uh, she had right-sided mesothelioma, resected out, uh, radiated chemotherapy, and then uh, she had recurrences over the course of many, many years. And, you know, she would come and we would do ablation. Till once she developed uh, a recurrence on the opposite side, <coughs> contralateral side. And one of the things we were worried about is, is, is if this tumor continues to grow, it's going to block the left side, which is actually her good lung. So in, uh, in operation theater, we went ahead and placed a probe inside the tumor and we ablated it, we ablated this part of it, and Dr. Cameron also put some uh, gel uh, or, or see, what did you put there? Gore-Tex, Gore yes. Um, to, to make sure that, you know, when I put the next, when I go back and put the needle, it doesn't hit the left atrium. Uh, we did a scan in three months time, there was residual tumor, and we went back again and put multiple probes in there. Look at the ice ball really growing, carving out the left atrium and then you can see it's being carved out by the bronchus. Uh, if again here, the ice ball engulfs the bronchus very, um, very nicely, but the bronchus doesn't get damaged. That's the advantage of a cartilage. This, this was the only case we've done under general anesthesia. All our cases we do under local, because we just didn't want her to move around uh, when we were doing this procedure. This is some other example. As I said, these patients like to, they recur at this sort of like crevices, you know, deep sulci all the way down into 12 ribs. This is a tumor between aorta and vertebral artery. I mean, there's no way we could have done this with other, other modality. So we go ahead and place these probes in there and then do an ablation. You can see the ice ball, again, carving out the aorta. And you know that the aorta, aortic wall will not get damaged by the ice ball at that level simply because its matrix remains intact. So that's a good thing. Also, aorta is like a very high blood flow, so it's got at 37 degrees. It always warms itself up, so the ice doesn't allow the ice ball to really grow into, into the aorta itself. Uh, th again, the probe, here's the probe here, and you can see the ice ball again nicely in the soft tissue. Um, this was challenging was the recurrence next to IBC. IBC is my far smaller, thinner wall. We were worried about whether it's going to stay intact or not. Uh, didn't have a choice. We placed the probes in there and then we went ahead. We do this in very uh, sort of a, I would say, stepwise. We do an ice ball, wait, do a scan, make sure the aorta is absolute and the IBC is normal and then we go on. It's this thing takes two to three hours to do because of the continuous scanning and monitoring the patient. Um, so we just don't jab the probes in. And this is a follow-up of, you can see the tumors regressed in size uh, and did not recur. Uh, visualization of ablation H, I think that is very important for us. These tumors recur in the chest wall. I'm sure you've seen these things, difficult to handle, painful. And so we do require to have a modality which we make sure we know where it's extending and not cause injury to the skin. Here we, uh, we can see the ice ball, we inject saline, we put some warm gloves on top to make sure we don't cause uh, uh, ice injury or frostbite to the skin. So that's something we use. And finally, the synergistic effect, and that's great. You know, if 
as we go on, I'll show you our data, some of the tumors we have to deal with are very large. Now, if you look at the, uh, just the ice ball size itself, as you can see here, and you, and, you, and you just draw the circles, that would be the expected sort of ice ball. But once you put all these probes together, the amount of energy and the, they kind of have a synergistic effect and you get a much larger ice ball than anticipated. And that's something you can take advantage of. So I'm gonna go through our data. Um, because it's the only, only data on cryoablation of uh, recurrent mesothelioma. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about the safety, the early term, term efficacy, and also what are the, uh, some of the predictors of local recurrence. So this was, uh, again, will be very specific. This was done on patients who had had <coughs> surgery before that had, they had or may not have had adjuvant therapy, that means chemotherapy. Uh, they had local recurrences. These patients had undergone at least one cryoablation and they were followed up with CT or PET. There were 24 patients, we did 110 cryoablations. So as you can see, some patients had multiple cryoablations. This is, a, uh, this is basically how we did them. Uh, only one cryo needed general anesthesia. You saw that image. Most of them were done under conscious sedation and local anesthesia. They were discharged on the same day. Mean age was 64. We had patients from 48 to 82. Almost equal division, a little bit of more male than female. And this is a histology type, you know, epithelioid mix. Some of them were sarcomatoid and one stage was unknown. And staging, this is surgical staging again. We all anticipate to go in at N0, N2, but sometimes it's more than that. And you can see some of the patients were at higher stages. Um, there were two groups, local group and a palliative group. Local control, we intended to locally control it. Palliative was like the tumors which were very close to the heart and we know, for example, we were not going to achieve full control, but we wanted to debulk the lesion. I'll just go to overall numbers. Um, the disease overall, uh, free, uh, disease free interval was between three months to almost eight years. That's uh, what you can see. Um, the number of ablations we did one to 25, a median of three. Some patients got up to 25 ablations. Um, number of lesions at first ablation, some was in this particular group was one to 14. Some patients had up to 14 lesions and we caught up to it. Of course, in palliative group, you can have n number of lesions. Tumor size, uh, this is in my, it's quite impressive. The size was up to 113 uh, millimeters. That's up to, up to 11 centimeter tumors we managed to ablate on local control. And um, this was a long axis, of course, and this is a short axis. As you can see, these tumors are mostly sausage shaped. You know, just given the pattern of pleura and the way they recur, uh, that's how they're like, they're longer than shorter. This is a one of our patients. We did multiple ablations. You can see this was one side. We ablated it, goes away. This is another side comes. We ablate it, it kind of goes away. There's another side brewing. We go back and ablate it because they're cancer cells. They keep on coming back and we keep on going and doing these ablations. We did uh, three cycles. These ablations, by the way, take much longer than when we do lung cancer or metastases. Simply because they're larger, you gotta be careful about all the surrounding structure. Um, but, uh, and you do much, many more uh, ablation cycles. You also get a freedom to do more cycles. You don't have to deal with complications of needle in the lung. You know, lung is air, you put a needle, pop, you know, you get air leaking out. But these patients don't have that, that, that problem. Uh, so we get a chance to spend more time and try to ablate and get as much tumor as we can. So one to four cycles, number of cycles, each cycle is around 10 minutes, as you can see here. The total time was up to 40 minutes. That means 40 minutes of ablation on a patient. And pause cycles up to four. Um, longest pause cycle, that means longest time waited was seven minutes. And number of cryoborobes, that's important. Sometimes up to seven probes were placed in patient. And these are for larger tumors. So that I showed you, each ice ball can get only a particular size. Uh, this is an example of a patient. These were the two tumors we wanted to ablate. As you can see, there's tumors here, the tumors here, and the tumors here, and we went back and got them all. But this was the interesting part. We don't want this to grow into the cord uh, and, and the canal, and we can't do it. But for this simple two nodules, we had to place four probes 
uh, and God gets a sort of a large ice ball sort of in that region. Results, we had very limited complications. Only eight out of 110 patients had complications. And this is CTCAE1, or like the adverse event uh, one and two, which is like really not just limited escalation of care. And one of them only developed a chest wall abscess who Dr. Cameron went ahead and debulked it and cleared it out. So none of these patients died. None of these patients had required prolonged hospital stay. And it was just mostly managed uh, as outpatient. Recurrence, uh, in 30 days, we had no recurrence, as expected. But we can see as we go down um, six months, one year, 90% uh, there was no recurrence. We controlled the tumors 90% uh, at one year, 87 at two years, and 73% at three years. And we saw that if we continue observing these patients, although the ablation zone may not recur, the tumor is next to it, and that recurs. And it becomes very difficult to say what actually recurred. Was it the tumor which took the new tumor site, or is it actually the ablation site? Because the ablation site really starts to shrink down. But we consider those as recurrences, just to be like uh, more accurate. Uh, and this is it, the recurrence occurred between four months up to 24 months. So some of the recurrences were actually two years down the line. So we follow our patients regularly. I think one of the, I think, very important things I hope gets highlighted is that we have a very vigorous mesothelioma tumor board. We sit on a phone call every day, ev not every day, every week on Wednesdays. And no matter what, come rain, come the no lunch or whatever, surgery, and we go through all the cases, and it, uh, that allows us to come, come with a, like a combined approach to these tumors. I'm not gonna show this case, I'll show you already. That was the case we did on the show. So in conclusion, we had a very minimal mor morbidity of 7.3% and high efficacy at one year of 90% and 73% at three years. And I think cry uh, no, cryoablation can provide an alternative adjunctive method uh, for local control of tumors after recurrence. Regarding future directions, I really want to hear what everyone has to say. There's so much uh, coming. I, I just, like old was, I don't know how you remember all these clinical trials. There should be apps for it, you know? <laughs> yeah, there probably is, yeah. But I think uh, there is a role of cryo combining it with immune modulators, uh, and maybe even as Dr. Cameron showed in his uh, last slide, but it'd be useful with even before surgery. And with that, I would like to thank everybody. Oh, that, and that's my summary. summary. Um, it is a safe method, as we saw, very limited complication rate. It is highly efficacious. Um, not all patients are candidates for local control. And, um, and for some of our patients, systemic therapy is needed. We still try to reserve it for later. And there is a potential use of cryo as an immune stimulator. And now with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's been working with <laughs> on this experiment.